clashes at the Holy Land at the start of a holy weekend. Tensions erupt in Jerusalem as Israeli forces storm the Al-Aqsa Mosque, one of Islam's holiest sites. As Muslim worshipers gathered for prayer, more than 150 Palestinians hurt, the city now on edge about what could happen next. For the first time, a subway shooting survivor coming forward to talk about the rush hour terror, taking us inside how the attack unfolded. Now we're learning new details of the suspect's movements after the horror, including his walk through Manhattan, plus celebrating those who may have saved lives, the city's honor for transit workers, and the plan to split the reward money. An ominous warning from Russia to the U.S. and NATO, stop arming Ukraine or face, quote, unpredictable consequences. This as the Pentagon confirms that two Ukrainian missiles struck Russia's massive warship, sending it to the bottom of the Black Sea. A huge setback and a humiliating reality for Putin's army. Conflict and chaos is putting the plans of young people on pause. Two couples, one from Ukraine, the other from Russia, give us an intimate look at their lives during war. We're not fleeing anywhere because we believe in our army. Our army is super, super strong. Hope that we will win, but honestly, I believe that we will win this war. Twitter firing back. The platform's board of directors says no thanks to Elon Musk's $43 billion offer for a takeover, instead opting for a corporate defense plan. What we know about this so-called poison pill and will it be enough to fend off Musk? 75 years ago, Jackie Robinson shattered the color barrier and set the stage for a change in society. Tonight, the baseball legend's enduring legacy as told by his son. He was a man of few words, but a man of action, responsibility. Good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We are going to begin tonight with new threats to the U.S. from Russia after that humiliating loss of the flagship of its Black Sea fleet. Tonight, the Pentagon confirming that ship was struck by two Ukrainian missiles. The U.S. has also confirmed it has received an official warning from Russia protesting U.S. and NATO military aid in Ukraine. The note urges the Allies to stop arming Ukraine with advanced weapons or face, quote, unpredictable consequences. Russia's warship, Moskva, is now at the bottom of the Black Sea, and that is a military and psychological defeat. So Russia hit back overnight, shelling a miss missile factory near Kyiv and threatening new attacks on command centers. With Russia preparing for a major offensive in eastern Ukraine, our James Longman is now in the city of Dnipro, closer to that fight, and he leads us off tonight. Tonight, Russia's revenge. Strikes on the outskirts of Kyiv, including on a factory that makes the anti-ship missiles like the ones used to destroy Russia's prized warship. For the first time, the Pentagon has said it believes that two Ukrainian Neptune missiles did hit the Moskova, Russia's Black Sea flagship, and they sunk it. Ukraine claims more than 400 sailors, including the captain, were killed. That would make it the most significant naval loss sustained by any country in more than 40 years. The less weapons the Russian Federation that attacked our country has, the better for us, the less capable they are. And as the war enters its 51st day, the heaviest fighting in the East. This new video circulating on social media shows Ukrainian and Russian soldiers firing at one another on a road in the Donetsk region. As the US begins delivering the $800 million worth of new weapons to Ukraine, tonight an ominous new warning. Russia sending a formal diplomatic message to the US and all nations arming the country, demanding they stop sending weapons or risk unpredictable consequences. With so many military setbacks for Russia, this stark assessment from the CIA. None of us can take lightly the threat posed by a potential resort to to tactical nuclear weapons. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky also saying the world should be ready for this deadly scenario. I think we, all of the world, all the countries have to be warned because you, you know that it can be not real information, but it, but it can be the truth. For, for them, life of the people is nothing. <laughs> Russia's withdrawal from areas around the capital means more brutal discoveries every day. More than 900 bodies, mostly civilians, have now been found in the region and in Bucha's now infamous mass gravesite, 350 alone. War crime investigators have begun their forensic research.
And further south, the battle for Mariupol rages. More than a month of endless bombardment has reduced the city to this. But fierce pockets of resistance remain. The commander of Ukrainian Marine Forces battling to break the siege issued this urgent plea for help. It can be done and it must be done as soon as possible, he said. Ukraine says 120,000 residents are still stuck there and possibly thousands dead. But if Russia completes its occupation, the true figure may never be known. And that is a terrifying thought. James Longman joins us now tonight from Dnipro. James, with all the accusations of Russian war crimes, there are reports Ukraine is asking the U.S. to make a big accusation against Russia. Yeah, that's right. Uh, President Zelensky has now apparently asked President Biden to designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. Now, President Zelensky has long been asking uh, his allies in the West to find ways to pressure and isolate Russia. But this would be uh, an enormous designation and actually only normally reserved for countries that are actually funding, funding uh, or sponsoring terrorism. And that's why the list currently has countries like North Korea, Iran, Cuba and Syria on it. In fact, they're the only four countries, so it would be pretty serious. Unlikely I think that it'll happen, but it just goes to show just the kind of level of outrage here in this country about what Russia has been doing. Phil. James Longman tonight from Dnipro. James, thank you. Here in New York, for the first time, we are now hearing from a survivor of this week's subway shooting as we learn more about what the suspect did in the hours after the attack, including how he hid in plain sight. And the city also honors transit workers who rushed to get passengers to safety. Here's ABC's Janae Norman. We're hearing from those being hailed heroes tonight. For the first time, the brave New York City transit workers speaking out. Passengers was coming off the train, falling to the floor, and I was shouting to the people, get on the train, get on the train, get on the train. Train conductor David Artis describing the tense moments he rushed to get passengers out of the smoke-filled subway car to the safety of another train across the platform. Artis, along with train conductor Raven Haynes, risking their own safety to help evacuate the station. As soon as you see smoke, the first thought is, I need to make sure that there's no one physically on my platform. Both would lead first responders to the injured passengers, telling ABC News they tried to stay brave and calm. It's like natural instincts kicked in, because as long as we are calm, cool, and collected, our passengers can be calm and collected. Police now say the suspected shooter, Frank James, blended in with those fleeing passengers and getting on that same train leaving the scene. And tonight, police piecing together his movements. Sources telling ABC News the suspect checked into the Chelsea International Hostel on West 20th Street in Manhattan the night of the shooting. The hostel denying James stayed there Tuesday, but adding that he has stayed there in the past. Emerging the next morning and wandering the streets of Lower Manhattan, hiding in plain sight, at 10.30, witnesses spotting him sitting outside a restaurant on Canal Street, appearing to charge his phone. A few hours later, at the famed Cat's Deli on the Lower East Side. At 1.42 p.m., James is taken into custody, ending the nearly 30-hour manhunt. The 62-year-old now being held without bail. Federal officials have charged him with carrying out a terrorist attack on a mass transit system. He faces up to life in prison if convicted. And Phil, late today, the NYPD thanking New Yorkers for helping find the suspect. Five people will split that $50,000 Crime Stoppers reward. And the police commissioner saying tonight, New Yorkers are who the department serves and are often the department's best partners. Phil. All right, Janae, thank you. And be sure to tune in Sunday morning to this week for an exclusive joint interview with New York City Mayor Eric Adams and NYPD Commissioner Keechan Sewell. Now to the Middle East. Already high tensions between Israeli Defense Forces and Palestinians continue to rise tonight after Israeli police raided Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque, leading to clashes with Palestinian worshippers that left more than 150 wounded. This at one of the holiest times of the year for Jews, Muslims and Christians. ABC's Lama Hassan has more from London. Tonight, Jerusalem on a knife edge after Israeli security forces stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque, one of Islam's holiest sites with Muslim worshippers gathered for Friday prayers. Firing tear gas and stun grenades inside the mosque. More than 150 Palestinians were injured and at least four Israeli soldiers were wounded. Israeli officials insist they waited until after prayers and released this video which they say shows Palestinians throwing stones and fireworks below at the Western Wall. The site sacred to both Muslims and Jews, where the Haram al-Sharif 
and the Temple Mount are located. Clashes here ignited an 11-day war with militants in the Gaza Strip last year. Tensions already extremely high after several recent attacks inside Israel, including a gunman opening fire at a bar in the middle of a bustling street in Tel Aviv, killing three Israelis. Lama Hassan joins us now. And Lama, this is a rare intersection of three of the world's major religions celebrating the Holy Land. How tense is the situation there? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Phil. All three major religions are celebrating this weekend. You have the Jewish festival of Passover as well, taking place at the same time as the Islamic holy month of Ramadan. And yes, the Easter celebrations all taking place this weekend, uh, more or less in the same area in the holy city uh, in Jerusalem. I think today tensions were high after those clashes broke out between uh, Palestinian worshippers at Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, between the Palestinians and the Israeli security forces. But I think Tensions were already high in the country after a recent spate of deadly violence inside Israel. The most recent attack uh, taking place uh, when a gunman opened fire in a bar uh, on a bustling street in Tel Aviv. Uh, now, the Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett saying today in anticipation of, of possible clashes taking place this weekend that they are preparing from, for any kind of scenario. And tonight, uh, Jerusalem appears to be quiet, but some fear that it is a fragile calm. Phil. All eyes on the Holy Land. Lama Hassan from London, thank you. Now to the battle over Twitter as the company pushes back a potential takeover. Twitter's board of directors is firing back with a counterattack designed to block Elon Musk's $43 billion attempt to buy the social media platform. It is called a poison pill strategy. ABC's Kaylee Hartung explains what that is and why it's not foolproof. Tonight, after Elon Musk's bid to take over Twitter, the company's board fighting back with a corporate defense tactic known as a poison pill. If Musk or anyone else acquires 15% or more of the social media platform, Twitter will allow other existing shareholders to buy additional shares at a discount. Just last week, Musk disclosing that he now owns more than 9% of the company, making him one of the largest shareholders. It puts a blockade up from Musk if he wants to go down the corporate radar route to ultimately limit his ability to build shares. It's Twitter's latest move to box out the world's wealthiest man. Last week, they offered him a seat on their board. When he found out he wouldn't be allowed to publicly criticize the company, he turned it down. Twitter has become kind of the de facto town square. Just hours after announcing his $43 billion offer to buy Twitter on Twitter, Musk appearing at a TED conference, saying his buyout is extremely important to the future of civilization. But he was evasive when asked what he'll do if his offer is rejected. Is there a plan B? There is. <laughs> And Phil, Twitter says this plan is similar to other plans adopted by publicly held companies in comparable circumstances. Elon Musk, though, is an unpredictable man. So this is now a wait and see game of what his next move will be. Phil? Unpredictable indeed. Kaylee, thanks so much. Now to the holiday travel rush as many schools are on spring break. And this comes amid rising airfares and renewed concern about COVID-19. 31 states and territories now seeing an increase of at least 10% in cases. Our transportation correspondent Gio Benitez reports. Tonight, one of spring's busiest travel weekends now underway. Today and Monday are expected to be the busiest travel days nationwide, united alone with more than 400,000 passengers a day, Delta with nearly half a million. I think will be one of the busiest Passover Easter weekends we have seen in recent history, perhaps the past three, four, even five years. Airfare also up by 40% for domestic flights just since January. This comes after several weekends of mass cancellations blamed on weather and pilot shortages. In fact, the Southwest Airlines Pilots Union writing to the CEO saying pilots are so exhausted, it's the company's number one safety threat. In a statement, Southwest saying weather and airspace delays led to fatigue in March and that calls from pilots too tired to fly are a result of the system working as designed. This is the industry uh, certainly paying a price for perhaps underestimating how quickly travel would rebound after COVID. And now with the BA2 subvariant fueling a fresh COVID wave, federal officials this week extending the transportation mask mandate until at least May 3rd. 
new cases and hospital admissions now up 10% or more in many parts of the country. Once something becomes dominant, usually about a week or 10 days later, uh, you start getting a pretty good sense of what's happening with hospitalization. Certainly by two weeks, I think we'll have a much clearer picture. Gio, thank you. And with millions traveling this holiday weekend, we will be watching the weather pretty closely tonight. A new storm moving into the west, parts of the south also bracing for some severe weather. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z joins us now. Hey, Ginger, can you help us time this out? Oh, my goodness, Phil. So southern Missouri, northern Arkansas, all in a severe thunderstorm watch yet tonight. That's along that cold front, and there was that low that was sliding across. Lots of windy conditions and considerably colder air piling into the northern plains and Great Lakes. But let's look at west and see the new storm. So this one is up to 15 inches of snow in the Sierra. There are parts of Oregon that had five and a half feet just this week and they're going to get more with that low. The Bay Area is going to get some much needed rain. There are wind advisories in Nevada, Utah and Arizona. But as we go to Easter Sunday itself, traditionally there will be outbreaks of severe weather and it looks like we could see that from Shreveport to Jackson, Mobile, even Pascagoula, Mississippi. Uh, we'll have to watch for not just damaging winds, but perhaps some tornadoes. Then across the country, otherwise though, the west is nice. Some snow again in the northern plains. Remember a foot and a half or so in northern North Dakota just this week, much cooler here in the Northeast, Phil. The weather is busy as the travel. Ginger, thanks so much. We're going to turn now to an ABC News exclusive interview with Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors. As gas prices continue to skyrocket, ABC News Rebecca Jarvis sat down with Barra to talk about taking on Tesla on what many say is the future, electric vehicles. Is there a tipping point with gas prices? Gas prices get above $4 a gallon. The orders for EVs start rolling in. I definitely think there's going to be more interest. But it, it'll depend on, you know, how long gas prices, and, you know, we all are wondering what the situation is there. General Motors CEO Mary Barra in an exclusive interview with ABC News, giving us an inside look at her company's latest car. So this is the Cadillac Lyric. An electric twist on an American classic. You got it and you don't hear the noise. Sharing her company's goal to dominate the U.S. EV market by 2025. Yeah, it rides very much like I would expect a car to, but without the sound. And surpassed Elon Musk's Tesla in sales. How do you talk about Elon Musk? You know, I respect all of our competitors, but it doesn't consume a lot of my day. If you are going to win in this space, when we win, you will have half to have beaten Elon Musk and Tesla. How are you going to do that? I have tremendous confidence in our brands, the strength of our brands, in our customers, and the loyalty that we have. Next year, GM expects to unveil two additional EVs, both under $40,000. And Barras is focused on the cars as she is with how Americans will be able to charge them. It's going to be uh, many solutions. You know, right now there's a lot of startups working in this space and we're partnering with them. We have committed to invest three quarters of a billion dollars in chargers, working with other companies as well as our dealers to find the right locations. But while that may be the future, there's also the current inflation facing consumers. A year from now, will your cars be more or less expensive than they are today. You know, it's really hard to hard to say because, you know, tell me what's going to happen from an overall economy perspective. What we see at General Motors is we do see a strong pricing environment and we see strong demand for our vehicles overall. When you say strong pricing, that basically means prices can go up from here. Well, and um, they will we'll moderate based on what's happening in the environment. I mean, right now we're in a unique situation because of the pandemic and then because of the semiconductor shortage. We haven't been able to make as many vehicles, so we have a lot of pent up demand. That is our battery lab. Barra, who sits on the board of Disney, ABC's parent company, had this to say about the economic outlook. Is there anything you've seen from your customer that suggests a recession could be looming? What we see right now is still very strong demand. But I would also say it's early days in, and everybody is looking at what is going to happen. Have you seen any changes in customers making their payments on their auto loans? We haven't, we've seen, you know, people making their payments. So from a financing perspective, it's a very good environment right now. Rebecca, thank you. When we come back, the wild chase caught on camera off the coast of Mexico, the massive drug bust by boat. Also on this Jackie Robinson day, how his legacy lives on through his son.
But first, Russia's war in Ukraine taking its toll on millennials, among everyone else, what some are doing to fight back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put your life at risk. the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. The war in Ukraine, as we know, has caused death, destruction, and a lot of devastation. It also interrupted plans for young people beginning to build their lives in their country. Two couples have made it their mission to fight back. Our Lindsay Davis gives us an intimate glimpse of their lives during conflict. We are now running to our shelter, which is just across the yard. You can hear the siren, so... Yeah, it's pretty scary, and we're going to shelter, yeah. Alina Nikitina is 28 years old, just one of an entire generation in Ukraine, putting her plans for the future on pause, living in the midst of war. sitting in our uh, safest corner of the of the of the, of the house um, just because we heard the siren and uh, we didn't have a chance just now to run to the shelter she along with her partner Vadim Muha are documenting their experience in Kyiv since the Russians first invaded so we have the essentials we have medicine another medicine uh, we have snacks uh, we have documents already inside. Not far away, painful reminders of those who tried to flee and died. But Alina and Vadim remain in Kyiv, confident in their army, 
confident in their country. We're here, we're staying in Kiev, we're not fleeing anywhere because we believe in our army. Our army is super, super strong. And um, yeah, have you seen us like for the past week? Hope that we will win. But honestly, I believe that we will win this war. The International Committee of the Red Cross conducted a survey in 2020, interviewing more than 16,000 millennials around the world concerning their views on war. It found that nearly half believed there would be a third world war in their lifetime. 74% believed that wars were avoidable. Two millennial couples, one in Ukraine, the other in Russia, fighting for the same cause in different ways, but both desiring the same outcome, an end to the war. A well-known climate activist, Arshak Makachan, is now trying to save the planet by seeking peace for its inhabitants, protesting to stop the genocide, rape, and brutal killings of Ukrainians. Arshak and his friends raise glasses, a toast to President Zelensky, who's the adversary of Putin, their own president. Arshak and his wife, Polina, know that by marching, they are risking their lives. I can't talk about our activism because it's dangerous for us and I can't talk about our plans. But uh, I'll talk about our lives in Russia, collapsing country. More than half of Russia's citizens believe Putin's claims and propaganda that he is fighting a neo-Nazi government in Ukraine and denying war crimes, disputing the grisly scenes of death. They having this like fascist symbol like the Z. It's meaningless and stupid and they, they even don't understand that it's fascist. They think that they are like the good ones. And propaganda is doing its work and, and people continuing their lives. While Russian troops are allegedly murdering many who do not surrender, Alina and Vadim remain in Kyiv, doing whatever they can to help their country. Well, we had some free time uh, in between the sirens and uh, we gathered uh, like um, some sort of humanitarian aid. Thanks God everybody is alive, but still like this is the situation that we are living in Kyiv day by day. We have at 4 a.m. alarms because these are firing missiles. <laughs> We were marching with our friends. There were so many police. And my friend she was arrested just for putting a sticker with words, Ukraine isn't our enemy. Facing danger, the young activists attempt to flee. We couldn't cross the border to Poland for the first time. Uh, any Russian couldn't. Uh, it was very difficult to buy tickets for the bus because they don't sell here tickets to Russian people in Belarus. Finally, getting on that bus, all that is left is to say goodbye. New country, same mission, protesting in Germany, calling for change, fighting for peace. Russian people getting killed, tortured, imprisoned, fired, expelled for their protest. There has been more than 15,000 people detainments in anti-war protest. It's a record for Russian history. And immediately stop fueling the war. Lindsay Davis, thank you. Remarkable young couples. Strength. Still ahead here on Prime, turning her life experience into laughs. Our conversation with a star comedian now out with her own Netflix show. Also, the person who paid $518,000 for what they thought was the football thrown in Tom Brady's last touchdown, breathing a little easier tonight. And it's the end of an era for Kmart. There once were thousands of stores, now single digits. We're going to take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day on this Jackie Robinson day, the number 42 jerseys sit at the ready for the L.A. Dodgers. Every player in baseball will wear Robinson's old number tonight in honor of his barrier-breaking career. you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. 
Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black markets, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Welcome back. And attention Kmart shoppers. For many, it is the end of an era as one of the last Kmart stores will close its doors for good this weekend. So let's take a look at Kmart and the current state of retail by the numbers. There will be just three Kmart stores left in the U.S. after the Avenel, New Jersey store closes its doors tomorrow. Kmart shoppers will need to travel to Westwood, New Jersey, Bridgehampton, New York, or Miami for their blue light specials. The company was founded in 1962 and at its peak had more than 2,000 stores, but the chain has been struggling for years, filing for bankruptcy protection back in 2002, and a joint effort with Sears didn't pan out either. But Kmart isn't alone. Up to 50,000 retail stores are predicted to close over the next five years. That's according to a report released this week by UBS, as the stores struggle to compete with industry titans like Walmart, Target, and Amazon. The investment banking company says 23,000 500 of those stores will be clothing and accessories, consumer electronics, and home furnishing chains. That's out of about 880,000 retail stores UBS tracks nationwide. But so far this year, openings are far outpacing closings with 3,694 new store openings and just 1,385 closings. And that's according to CoreSight Research tracking data. That growth is being driven by discount stores like Dollar General and TJ Maxx as well as some online retailers that are expanding to brick and mortar. And there are 115,000 shopping centers in the U.S. Now, that is up from just 90,000 two years ago. The UBS report says neighborhood strip centers are likely to do far better than traditional shopping malls as consumers increasingly favor quick trips to stores closer to where they live. And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime. The scary situation in Kansas after a gas plant fire forces evacuations. Also, the road rage arrest. The man charged with running over a woman. And imagine having to battle to the death your clone. That's the reality for Guardians of the Galaxy actress Karen Gillan. Our conversation with the Hollywood star next. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. Time 
anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Fears of Russian retaliation rising after its largest warship in the Black Sea, the Moskva, sank Thursday. Today, senior U.S. defense officials announcing they now believe two Ukrainian Neptune missiles struck the Moskva, confirming Ukraine's initial claims and countering Russian claims of an accidental onboard ammunition fire. State Department spokesman Ned Price declining direct comment on reports of Russia threatening consequences to the U.S. for its military support of Ukraine. The U.S. has already begun shipping off $800 million in weapons and heavy artillery in Mariupol, an historic city center is now in ruin, barely hanging on after weeks of bombardment and siege. Across Ukraine, several humanitarian Humanitarian corridors now open again, allowing safe escape for civilians. In Kansas, residents returning home after a natural gas explosion at a plant in the town of Haven. Officials say the threat from the liquid natural gas storage is over. No one killed, but two people suffered minor injuries. Vessel release valves were believed to be compromised and created a potential for explosion at any time. Last night, this led to evacuations of anything within mile and a half of that plant. We're very fortunate that there's only two that were that had minor injuries and we didn't have any fatalities. A New Jersey man is under arrest, charged with attempted murder in a violent case of road rage. Police say Vincent John and a woman were involved in a minor traffic accident. He began pursuing her after she tried to take pictures of his vehicle. He then chased her down, drove over her, backed up and drove over her again. The woman was rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Maria Silvia taking to TikTok with a warning. The 25-year-old posting about her diagnosis with a rare form of skin cancer, subungual melanoma. Her video generating over 30 million views. When he told me that, you know, oh, we found melanoma, you know, my heart dropped. And, you know, he was rattling off these phone numbers that I had to call. And I'm still, like, grasping that I just found out that I had cancer. Sylvia first noticed the brown strip across her nail in 2014 after being told that it might be just a mole. I finally decided to 
to go and get that looked at. And when it came back, uh, the biopsy said that it was a melanoma case. Acrolentigenous melanoma is a skin cancer that doesn't appear to be caused by sunlight, making up less than 5% of melanoma skin cancer worldwide. Now Sylvia's story is shedding light on the rare disease and other TikTokers like this one say it has forced them to get checked. So I saw this TikTok a couple weeks ago and really thought nothing of it until I saw my mom's toe and was really concerned and she got an appointment and long story short, you saved my mom's life. It turns out that infamous football Tom Brady used to throw what was thought to be his last touchdown pass will not be sold after all. The ball had sold for $518,000 less than 24 hours after the seven-time Super Bowl champ announced his retirement in January. Well, that retirement lasted all of 40 days. Buyer and seller have now agreed to nullify the sale. All oh, right, let's go. Jerry, let's go. It's time to eat. We're going to dinner. Dinner? Actress Liz Sheridan, best known for playing Jerry Seinfeld's mother on the classic TV series, has died. Now her death comes less than two weeks after George's TV mom, Estelle Harris, passed away. Sheridan was a veteran of the stage and began her career in the 1970s. Her manager saying she was always grateful to her fans and felt blessed to have enjoyed decades of work. Liz Sheridan was 93. We are also tracking several headlines around the world at this hour. The UK has reached a deal to send tens of thousands of undocumented immigrants from around the world to Rwanda. Britain has agreed to contribute nearly $160 million to Rwandan economic development. In exchange, Rwanda's foreign minister said immigrants will be given education and employment opportunities. Last year, more than 28,000 people entered Britain illegally. Opposition politicians in the UK are calling the plan unethical, even illegal. The Mexican Navy releasing this surveillance drone video showing a high-speed chase about 50 nautical miles from the resort city of Puerto Vallarta. Uh, the video shows an open boat loaded with packages of cocaine being chased by the Mexican Navy. The military says it se seized 1.2 million, uh, 1.2 tons rather, excuse me, of cocaine and arrested one suspect as well. To North Korea. Fireworks, dancing, celebrating the 110th anniversary of the birth of founder Kim Il-sung. The Day of the Sun, as it's called, is North Korea's biggest annual public holiday. This year, State TV showed costume dancers at an evening event, but notably did not mention the customary military parade. She has quickly become one of the most recognizable actors in the world, starring in hits like Doctor Who and Guardians of the Galaxy. Karen Gillan joined Will Reeve to discuss doing a movie in which she finds herself in a battle to the death against her clone. Here's Will with details. It's good to see you, and thank nice you. Nice to see you. This film, I have been trying to describe it, and <laughs> I'm failing. Maybe you could do a better job? I don't know if I'm going to be able to. It's such a unique tone for a film. Hi, I'm currently dying, and I would like to schedule a consultation. That is really hard to describe. You kind of need to just see it. But I would try to describe it as darkly funny, um, uh, quirky, uh, very deadpan. I think it's hilarious, personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that brings to me to my next question. It is a a serious premise, uh, a hypothetical to be sure that you're being cloned and then have to duel with said clone. Yes. But there's a dark humor to it. And mm -hmm. would you describe it as a dark comedy, as a drama that's funny, as a thriller with humor? Or something else? I'd probably describe it as a, as a dark comedy. I mean, it definitely has elements of like, it's kind of like exploring what it is to exist and, and, and what that means and whether you want to fight for your life or not. Um, and so there's like a sci-fi element to it with the cloning process. But really, I would describe it as, as, a, as a dark comedy. It's very unique. It's not normal to not be able to describe the movie in one sentence, but that's how different this movie is. <laughs> Did the uniqueness of the film draw you to it more than other projects that come your way? Definitely, yeah. So I read the script and I was like, this is like nothing like I've ever read before. The writing was so unique to the writer, Riley Stearns, who's also the director. Everything was very like overwritten and robotic in this really fascinating way. And then I learned that that's the way that he talks, actually. So then I got to just kind of like study him a little bit, put that into my portrayal of the character, um, which was really fun to do. 
portrayal of the characters, though. You're Durs, playing, yeah. you're Plural. Playing, are you playing one person or are you playing two people? What are the differences between your quote unquote real self in the character mm -hmm. and the clone version? That's a really interesting question. Are they two different characters? I would say from my perspective, yes, they are two different characters. They're working with the same toolkit, the same DNA, yet they've had completely different life experiences. So I would say that the sort of circumstances has made them two different people. In your preparation for the film and you're building out your character's world, what did you do to differentiate between the two slightly different characters that you're playing, even though they are a person and her clone? I would say that my, the main character, Sarah, kind of begins the movie feeling very kind of, um, she's just coasting through life. She's really not appreciating the fact that she has this life. She's just kind of going day to day, uh, low confidence, low self-worth. Um, and then she has this clone made of herself. She comes out and she's completely, you know, optimistic. She would be the version of Sarah had Sarah not been beaten down so much by life. And so she comes out more confident, more self-assured, and then gradually gets beaten down throughout the movie. And they kind of swap places in a way. What, would it, what do you think it would be like to have a clone in real life? <laughs> that would be really weird. I don't know what I'd do with it, but it would definitely involve pranking people in some way <laughs> or sending them to do the things that I don't want to do. Like the really <laughs> early mornings. I would like to have a clone for those. Aaron Paul is in this movie. It was great to see him. Yes. And there's a specific moment he asks, do you want to live? And essentially... Both Sarahs want to live for their own reasons. Mm -hmm. What do you think that says about what this movie says about the meaning of really living at all? I think a lot of us are, can fall into a pattern of forgetting that this is temporary. Um, and we kind of need to, to value each moment and value the fact that we're here because we're incredibly lucky to be here I'm getting really sentimental now. <laughs> it's true. But, it, you know, I, I just, yeah. Making the movie made me, you know, realize almost that, you know, you have to really savor every moment. And finally, recently you were the Grand Marshal, I understand, of the Tartan Day Parade in New York City. Yes, celebrating, Holland. Yeah, celebrating the Scottish community. You seem to represent them quite well and enthusiastically. <laughs> What does it mean to you to be able to be in a position where people from your home country look up to you and you get to represent where you're from in the US? It's incredible. I'm so proud of being from Scotland. I love Scotland so much. It's always gonna be my home. Um, I do live over in the States now, but it's just so lovely to be able to represent our culture and our people over here and just celebrate all things Scottish. It's a great country and the people are brilliant. As are you. Thank you so much you. <laughs> for your time. Congratulations on, on all your success, including this film. And Will Reeve, thank you. Turning life experience into laughter. Miss Pat is a stand-up comedian and actress known for her hit sitcom, The Miss Pat Show, appropriately named, uh, streaming on BET Plus, and a podcast host as well. She does everything now. Miss Pat is out with a new Netflix special called Y'all Want to Hear Something Crazy, and I certainly do. Let's take a listen. I realized that white schools do not celebrate Black History Month the same way black schools do. Mm -mm. White schools celebrate Black History Month according to how many black kids is at the school. <laughs> so if it's four, it's four days. <laughs> okay, Miss Pat joins us now. Welcome to the show. It's good to have you here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I just want to say something to you that I think can only be a compliment when you're talking to a comedian. You are ridiculously funny. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I laugh out loud every time I listen to you. But also, you, you use your stage to talk about some uncomfortable truths, which is where a lot of the comedy comes from. How else do you challenge your audiences? Uh, I challenge my audience by finding the darkest things in their life and trying to uh, make it funny. So, you know, don't dwell over stuff you can't 
control, laugh about it. You can't change the past. And I tell them all the time, I say, the wasted energy you giving on hating or hurt, you can be finding a way to laugh at it. Yeah, and you definitely practice what you're preaching there because you talk about growing up in Atlanta, going to juvie, your mom renting houses with chimneys to cook in, getting pregnant at 13, you go there. What inspired you to share your own personal story in this way in your stand-up? Well, I never wanted to be a stand-up, never really thought I was funny. So when I really dug into it and I started telling people's story, they was like, oh, you got a lot of stories like Richard Pryor. And I didn't even really mm. know who Richard Pryor was. So I did my homework and I said, I think I can do this. <laughs> and I just wanted to be honest. And I figured nobody was out there, had the stories that I had, and why not go for it? Plus, I'm a convicted felon, so it's the only job I can do, <laughs> and nobody checks my criminal background history. <laughs> Putting your name in the same sentence as Richard Pryor, you now know, know how special that is, right? He was ridiculously funny, too. Um, you yes, end, he was. You end the special talking about your superpower. Uh, which is really cool. And you, you say it's turning the darkest moments in your life, as you said, into comedy. Um, my experience that the comedians that I tend to like do that. They take real life situations and make humor out of it. Do you think that's the best comedy? Is that the comedy you like to listen to and laugh, laugh at? Yes, that's the best comedy to me because, you know, you're not the only person. Or I'm not the only person that went through what I went through or going through what I'm going, going through. And when other people can see you on stage laughing about the things that they're going through or the things that they experienced in the past, then they have a sense of just, whew, it ain't that bad. I can really laugh at it. Yeah, and you do that really well. But also, you know, you can say you're just doing that, but your timing, your comedic timing in your show is fantastic. You're currently shooting the second season of Miss Pat, um, which is based on your own life, of course. That's where your comedy comes from. What has been the reaction from the people closest to you, your loved ones? Uh, I don't know. I changed my phone number. I don't got no money. <laughs> <laughs> you know what people no. calling you. <laughs> um, I think everybody, especially my kids, you know, I don't have a close-knit family like a lot of people do, so I, I I had the opportunity in life to pick and choose the people that I wanted to be a part of my family. But, you know, my group of friends and family that I do have is very proud of me. They, you know, it's almost looking up like, did she really make it that far? <laughs> I ask myself that sometimes, too. So everybody's pretty proud, especially my husband, who told me <laughs> not to be a comedian and to stay at General Motors and Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> that was not the best plan for you. Do you, you tell him all the time, every time you get a, you know, a check from one of the shows, you were wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I do. He's retired. He just retired, too, so he knows he's wrong because he retired a few years early. <laughs> I bet he retired. Uh, what else is in store for, for Miss Pat? What do you see yourself doing next? Because this clearly, uh, you know, isn't the end. It's just the beginning of the show. You have your stand-up, the Netflix special. What's next? What do you see? Um, I'm movies. Um, I would love to produce. I would love to executive produce, get behind the camera. You know, that's what I want to do. I want to create a lot of things, uh, just other things that, you know, I can't put on BET Plus and uh, movies and stuff like that. I just uh, recently um, got some stuff working up over at Netflix that I can't quite talk about now, but it's a, it's a lot more to come of Miss Pat. Okay. Well, uh, you, we don't know each other. We just met, but can I ask you to do me a favor? Yes. All right. When you do go to get behind the camera, will you promise me you'll get in front of the camera, too, in a movie? Because I think you'd be <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I'm going I'm to try. At first, I didn't like acting. I like reading out loud now. <laughs> well, you're good at all of it. Miss Pat, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, you make me smile every time, every time I listen to you, and, and now, of course, talking to you as well. You can watch Y'all Want to Hear Something Crazy, now streaming on Netflix, and uh, you can stream The Miss Pat Show on BET+. Thank you. Today here in New York, 42nd Street was renamed Jackie Robinson Way, of course commemorating the Hall of Famer's famous number two on this Jackie Robinson Day in the major leagues. This year marks 75 years since the Brooklyn Dodgers legend shattered the color barrier in baseball. And tonight, we bring you a story from the ESPN digital series Jackie to Me, marking the milestone as his oldest living son, David, shares the lessons he learned from his father. On a personal level, 
My father wanted to build a strong family and be a strong father. He grew up in a house without a father. He wanted to be someone who could support his mother, who grew up as a sharecropper, and his grandmother, who was born a slave. He was a man of few words, but a man of action, responsibility. Um, he did not give a long lecture about responsibility. But when it was my turn to cut the grass, for example, Saturday morning, supposed to be out early cutting the grass. If and, and I have, on a few occasions, been caught laying in bed, and I'd hear the lawnmower start. And I'd look out the window, and I'd see my father cutting the grass that I was supposed to cut. So he didn't have to give me a lecture about responsibility and, and shirking responsibility. He went out and said, you know, that there's a job that needs to be done. And you can either take that responsibility and do it, or somebody might have to do it for you. And it's, it's to your greater shame if it's your own father. I have a dream that my poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. This is a picture of my father and I at the March on Washington. You know, being a father was important to him. And so uh, every opportunity he got, he would take his children by the hand or the shoulder and try to show them life with his arm around me, leading me in the front of that march to say without words, this son is part of your inheritance. This is a challenge that you are going to have to have. You know, he could see at that point, this is not something that was going to be achieved in a single generation. And I think that's one of the difficulties of, of, of our generations today is understanding who you are, where you've come from, what your responsibilities are, and what, in fact, the purpose of life is. The full 12-part series, Jackie to Me, is now available on the ESPN app. And before we go tonight, the images of the day. First, to Mexico City, where a Nazarene carries a, a wooden cross during a passion play on this Good Friday, where one of Mexico City's boroughs hosts one of the oldest and most elaborate recreations every year. And then in Berlin, Jewish families who fled Ukraine pray for peace and light candles at the beginning of Passover here at the Chabad Lubavitch Jewish Educational Center. Praying for peace, a beautiful thing this weekend. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. More Americans choose ABC News, America's 